They tell you that uh, in the 1750s, 4,500 people, and in the 1790s, 5,600. So of that, about 150 poor, about 45 to 50 are supported in the poor house. And some as choose to go about begging are supplies with badges to distinguish them as the only medicant poor belonging to the town. Diseases, which I really like. Consumptions and rheumatisms are frequent here. And that they are indeed in all variable climates, especially when due pains are not taken to defend the body. Well, I would imagine that very poor people did not have warm, waterproof town clothes in those days and possibly, probably did not even have shoes. And again, a bit more about disease. And priests were very proud of themselves because they started inoculation in 1733, much earlier than in many parts of Scotland. They also ask about antiques. So there's a Roman sandal and an interesting coin. They also do a bit of tourism in the town of Dumfries, serving in such measure, measure as a capital, not merely to the Shire, but also to Galloway. So I'm sure Newton's student wouldn't like that so much. And having easy and regular intercourse with London and Edinburgh, and even with the capital of Ireland, has thus become remarkable as a provincial town for elegance, information, and varied amusement. The character of the inhabitants is allowed to, when, is allowed to be, in general, very respectable. They are charitable, benevolent, hospitable to strangers, mixed frequently amongst themselves in domestic intercourse, and are sociable and polite. The next minister in the second account is not so kind. Second account, now he mentions an aurora borealis, which I think would probably be very unusual from Dumfries, describes it in detail, and that's just one of the many descriptions that he gives. He talks about a vaulted passage under the street in the Dumfries main street between the prison yard and the courtyard. Talk about government census so that you can see in the intervening years, by the time we get to 1830, we're almost double the population. Poaching in game and salmon fishery prevails to a considerable extent and there are inns. And I did check, the King's Arms in Dumfries still exists. And if you're thinking you've got 11,000 people, 168 of those individuals now have a license granted to sell ale and spirits, and this has an effect upon the morals of the population that's truly deplorable. So, so they've become uh, people who drink and they poach. They talk about breweries in Dumfries, and they talk about the manufacture of shoes and 300 individuals are employed in the making of these clogs. They talk about a steamboat that goes in the summer months between Dumfries and Whitehaven, and that's how they export the sheep down to, to England. And this is the one that just blows me away. At a fair in February, an incredible quantity of hare skins is purchased. The average number cannot be under 30,000. Now, they thought that there were even 30,000 hares to be caught and skinned is truly amazing. And they say 6,000 pounds were spent on these hares. And for me as well, in the 1830s, there's 600 head of Galloway cow, of cattle exposed between age two to three, so heifers probably, Galloways and now Highlanders. And on these occasions, the amount of money spent is 30,000 pounds, which must be equate to millions, I presume, in our days. Now, the last thing I wanted to show you about Dumfries, oh, no, sorry, I've got more here. The poor, there are now 560 poor, which roughly, to me, means almost four times as many poor as there were in the 1790s. The King's Arm is, is still, oh, have I gone back for me? King's Arms is still there. What I would like to talk about now is a cholera outbreak. Now, this is described in a great detail in the Dumfries Second Manuscript, over four pages, which I'm going to have to skip through, I think. But basically, they took them to the infirmary, 
The doctors there suffered. Two of them, local doctors, died themselves. One that had come down from Edinburgh also died. But they weren't... Uh, these, the local doctors were deeply regretted, and the third apparently wasn't. <laughs> they talk about the cholera being um, related to the tainted air. People don't go out anymore. When they're burying bodies, they don't go into the houses, they wait in the street. And they do a lot of large pits dug, and the bodies are put there in line. They try and burn pitch and tar on corners to try and prevent the disease. But eventually, a lot, roughly, I think it's late October, there's a huge thunderstorm that bursts over the town. Now, they think that the wind blows the cholera away, but we know now that it must have been a huge uh, downpour that washed the streams and the rivers. So eventually, total number of cases reported is 837. They're pretty sure, however, many cases were not reported. So my guess is probably a 1 in 10 number of people who were infected. And then they do, the minister has a little shot at doing a little bit of epidemiology, remarking that the proportion of females who were seized was greater than the number of men, possibly because they were pregnant or nursing, and say that children were equally likely, but they soon rallied. So there's a lot of very information interesting information in the accounts, not just numbers. I'll talk very quickly about the related resources, which are down here. These conclude the trans include the transcript of Sir John's questions, the manuscript reports from the individual parishes, which show the effect of the editorial committee on the parish reports. So these are the originals, which are very interesting to look at. So John tried hard using the specimens to persuade London. He took a, a country parish, a town parish, I think there's five in all, um, and tried to persuade the London government they should do the equivalent for England, but he didn't manage. There's correspondence relating to the accounts and an index of the ministers involved. Now, with the help of Nicola, who's dragged me into the 21st century of social media, we've created a Facebook page and a Twitter feed. And Nicola and myself have been extracting interesting bits and tidbits from the uh, accounts and been putting them up as little tweets. And we would very much welcome for the audience here, if you wish, to join us and put in tweets about your favourite bit of statistical accounts. Bob was talking earlier about interesting context-setting literature for the statistical accounts. This is our online login page. And here, under further reading, you'll find four essays, one of which is written by Bob, which helps set the context of the statistical accounts. If you're not a subscriber to the statistical accounts, you can view the page images. So you can't search the text, but you can, look, you can search for a parish and you can look at the images and print the pages just by clicking Browse Scanned Pages. If you do want to know about subscription, we now have an individual subscription available for two months six months and 12 months. And if you click here, that'll tell you how to, to get a subscription. And finally, just to show you again, the, the, there's no knowing what you get in the statistical accounts. When I was looking, sorry, this looks rather dark. It looks very nice on my screen. When I was looking for a, a, a picture to put on our little leaflet about the statistical accounts of Scotland, I came across the Pitlessie Fair which is on display in the National Gallery of Scotland. And it contains groups of people, soldiers, at a market with houses, and it shows sort of general chaos. There are cats and dogs down here, there's a cow here. And I thought, well, that's just perfect. And it was painted by Sir David Wilkie, aged 19. So I would love to say that I had planned this, but it's actually a coincidence. So, in cults, in the Statistical Accounts, second volume, there's a description of Pitlessie Fair. 
And it says that Laissez-faire was his first regular effort, so not a bad effort, as an artist, is now in the possession of a proprietor in an adjoining parish. It is a fine picture containing upwards of 150 figures, graphically delineated and admirably grouped, including portraits of Wilkie himself, his father, brothers and sisters, and many other characters as well known in the parish and neighbourhood during the painter's earlier years. So I've left some of our um, A5 leaflets at the door. So if you want to see a picture, a better picture of Pitlessy Fair, please feel free to pick up one of those. And I hope I've given you a flavour of the things that you can find in the statistical accounts. Thank you. <laughs>